greet you all this morning in Jesus' precious name. Glad to be here with you again. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you, God, for your goodness and for your mercy. We just ask your blessing, Father, upon this time together. Lord, help us be faithful to you. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. Help us, Father, I pray to find your truth, Lord, and walk in it. Lord, again, fill us with your spirit. Give us wisdom as we open your word and live our lives, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Again, greet you in Jesus' name. Keep in mind those who are sick among us. Just uh, pray for God's guidance and help us as we uh, pray for one another and watch out for one another. All right, let's open our Bibles to uh, John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Calphas into the Pragatorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the Pragatorium, so that they would not be defiled, but might eat of the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. To fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate entered in again into the Praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. All right. This uh, is when Jesus, standing before Pilate, this is the world trying the king. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. You know, some people just talk about someone that won't fight and they'll call them a coward sometimes. Or they'll say that they won't fight or they don't have any fight in them. Jesus, just at this point, 
is saying that if my kingdom was of this world, then would my servants fight? The, the whole thing is that a Christian is, it's not that he's not to fight, but he is fighting a different battle. And if it comes time, the Bible talks about, you know, we teach non-resistance to turn the other cheek. That's so that we would lift ourselves above the realm of this world and we're fighting a different battle. The Bible teaches in Revelation when Jesus comes back again, he's coming as a conqueror and his army is with him. And so that it's not the matter of, not the point that a Christian has no fight in him, but it's he's fighting a completely different battle. And if our king would say fight, and it's time to fight, they would be right there among the best of them. That's, that's, uh, so it's not that uh, we're not pacifist, as it's called, that people who just will not fight, we are non-resistant against evil. And that is, the purpose of that is to bring us to fight the battles that should be fought. A lot of times we, we fight battles, we choose, we choose the wrong battle to fight. And that's what he's talking about, and giving us wisdom to know the right battles to fight. And that goes along with what he said, you, G, Pilate questioning him, and Pilate asked him this question, what is truth? And that uh, he was basically mocking Jesus, but we see in this uh, question here that he asked that truth was laying at Pilate's door and he missed it. Here's a king, probably supposed to be a very wise king, but asking about truth, he missed it whenever it was right in front of him. And it wasn't just because Jesus was truth, but the very way that he came to the choice and the decision that he made was showing that he rejected truth. And for political reasons, chose not to side with truth because it wasn't convenient. You know, here he had this whole mob of Jews on an uproar, ready to, ready just to revolt. And he would have caused a, probably would have caused a big revolt among them. And so when he was faced with the truth, he said, one place I find no fault in this man. But yet the Jews were clamoring for his death. He's even offered again, said, well, I'll release a man. And they said, not him. We want the thief and the robber. We want the insurrectionist. We want the one that's raising the loudest noise, causing the most trouble, that's ready to take on the whole Roman army. We would rather have him released. And so he bowed to the one making the, the group that was making the largest noise or the loudest noise instead of to the truth. See, it was a, that's the thing about truth. It's something that is really obvious most of the time, but it appears to be sometimes the hardest path to take. But it's there. You know, whenever we talk about truth, we've said it many times that this Bible, this book that we read, truth itself, isn't to the educated. A simple child, a child can understand this truth. The Bible is written on a fourth grade level to where people of that age group or that type, the youngest with an understanding can understand it. That's why Jesus talked about out of the mouth of babes comes wisdom. And it's not because they're brilliant, it's just because they're simple enough to see what's right in front of their face. It's not because they're 
educated. It's because they're unhindered enough by the influences that corrupt truth that's all around them. And that is what the problem is. Truth is right in front of our face. You know, whenever you're looking for something to uh, making decisions and we see what we probably ought to do, but all of those corrupting influences around us mar that or cloud those decisions to where we can't see them. Don't want to see them. Because that would be a difficult path to take. That would be a hard path to take. That would be a costly path to take. That would be a path that often goes against everything we thought we knew. You see, when we're seeking truth, that's we need to have an honesty with ourselves. That's where the cross comes in. That's why Jesus talked about each one of us bearing our cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Right there's a here's an example of one that refused to take up his cross. He was unwilling to accept the consequences of his choosing truth. That's why I think why the early Christians talked a lot about Pilate. They often mentioned him as the one who made the decision. He was the judge. He was the one that had that in his power. And he had all the information before him. And it was clear what was right to him. He expressed that. But yet, he didn't take the truth. Someone who just takes the truth is not someone out there trying to force their ideas or their opinions down someone's throat. They're usually the ones that something is being forced on them. They're being pressured to make a decision by others, by other influences. And they begin to look at the influences around them instead of just what the truth is. And so they choose not to take up their cross. They would rather nullify the influences. They'd rather settle the mob they would rather appease the crowd than take the truth. Even though it might be very, very difficult for them just to do that. Like in Pilate's case. I mean, he would have been blamed by his own government, the Roman government, of causing the riots among the Jews. But that's the gravity of what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That's what makes the truth so difficult. Seeing the truth is not hard. Understanding the truth is not difficult. Actually walking in it is not that difficult, if that's our goal. But the consequences for walking in those truths come with a big heavy cross, and that's what makes it difficult. And that's why most people choose not to do it. Choose not to follow. Pilate. This is one thing, that, you know, we get the word politics. Political. We've got the term political correctness. All those are things are just, are words. And the very essence of politics is trying to smooth it over the best for the most amount of people to keep the things calmest. That's why it's so difficult for an honest man to be political because his decisions might just cause riots once in a while. They might just cause unrest among those who are agitating things. And that's the way Jesus was. That's why whenever he, he didn't talk with a political agenda, he didn't talk with, the, with an eye on appeasing the masses, he had the truth and he walked in it. Some people use that as, so that they can 
be the one causing the riot, causing the uproar, stirring everybody up because they've got the truth, but that's not what the truth does. The truth just walks in the path that's before us. It doesn't try to cause trouble. The things that pervert truth, that's why politics is so distasteful to the truth. Our own opinions, our own ideas, our own situations often hinder our desire for the truth. Theology, our theologies, they get in the way of truth sometimes because, wait a minute, that doesn't fit with what I believe. And so we shut down something so that we can maintain our theologies. And that's why there's schools. They're not a method of expanding our learning or a desire to find truth. When was the, you know, has there ever been a seminary or a college or something that was more interested in their maintaining and upholding their own theology or their own system instead of one that's based on truth that let each individual person have to face that place in their life where they want truth more than they want their own life. They want truth more than they want to maintain their system or their ideals. This, uh, that's why people fall into these things because it's, it's a risky thing to leave truth open, to leave it open to each person coming to that truth themselves versus having everything all figured out and nice and neat. Their own programs and agendas get in the way of truth. People have their own what they their own ideas of how it should be. And then emotions get in the way of truth. A lot of times. So many times we hear the example of all these people, these Jews that were clamoring for his death. There was an emotional uproar. And it has an effect on people. The tidal wave of emotions that we get carried away in and get caught up with. And it's so easy to challenge us and to, to make us think we're missing something because that's what everybody else is doing. And they always apply to an emotional element. We see all of this going on in the world. We can see it. But applying it to ourselves is when we don't see it a lot of times. We miss it whenever it's this close. One of the reasons that we reject a lot of the, well, the standard, the idea of a standard in churches is because it's group conscience. And so we're just going along with what the group says. And that's not any different than what the world's doing with how dare you question what we're saying because the multitudes of us are saying this. It's the same type of thing. That's why we reject the idea of a group conscience to determine how every man should run his own house or his own home that each individual, each person is going to stand before God as an individual and give an account of his own life. And there again, that's what makes it difficult because there's people that have different ideas. But to be, have the integrity for the truth, to allow each person to come to it himself, that's one thing that's so difficult among young people, I think, is that they get ideas in their heads 
and they want to just, they've got the idea that they're right. We all have that tendency, but it's real strong in young people, it seems, to where we're going to, this, my way is right. And it's the only way they can see. They get tunnel vision. And you can't see truth whenever you get that focused on one little thing. That's another way of weeding out the truth. How many people have had a right idea, but a wrong attitude? Uh, it doesn't matter how right your idea is. Most of the time, I'm not going to listen because it's brought in a wrong attitude. And the person with a right attitude can be real wrong sometimes, but still be ten times righter than the person that's right that's all wrong. It just... It, that heart of seeking after truth produces an attitude of having some truth to where the having the truth with a heart that's sealed on that or totally focused on it produces bad. It just doesn't produce right. And we see that in religion, and that's what religion does. It focuses on truth without the heart of truth. It focuses on truth to where we're willing to sacrifice anything for my truth. And that has the wrong thing. That just stinks. We get an agenda. this week uh, just in the medical field and one of the brothers was just saying well how can everything be so wrong isn't there somebody out there in the medical field that's seeking the truth there probably is there are people that want the truth but they're not the ones that, that the voices are being heard they're the voices that are being drowned out by everyone else. They're the ones that are, that are marked as rebels and troublemakers because they would dare question the authorities in how things are to be. But there are people, and just like in the spiritual realm, people that are just trying to walk in the truth and promote the truth are completely drowned out by the religious and their truth. One of the areas I appreciated uh, Bill's thought this morning of that of a young man beaten, wearing a path. And he found someone that had some wisdom. And he beat a path to his door. Just wore out his threshold. And I just think of myself whenever I was young and trying to find what this is all about, this Bible. And I don't know how many people that I found that I thought had some wisdom and I applied myself to that person. I wore the threshold out and often was disappointed after a while because they only wanted to go so far and that's usually within their little doctrinal realm. But I don't regret going to one of them because I learned from every one of them. I learned from them. And it's just as we've spent all that time and all the years studying and making mistakes and learning and growing and gaining more wisdom from the Lord and more insight and more knowledge trying to figure all this out. And it's just a blessing 
that that uh, God's had patience with us and God's had mercy, but there just isn't a lot of places that you can just go in the world and find a lot of wisdom, a lot of just people looking for truth. I want to. Whenever uh, one of the things we've got to one of the things I guess that I've, I've uh, when I found someone looking for the truth, when I found someone that had more than I did in any area, I was glad to go and listen to them. I was glad to sit under their feet and hear something. One of the most disagreeable things to me, and we try to teach this to young people, you know, there used to be the thing that child should be seen and not heard. Well, now the world's telling us, oh, we need to express, let them express themselves, and we want to listen to them because they've got so much to offer, and they really don't. You know, if they're just simple and can see little truths, we can learn from them. But they're not the leaders. They're not the teachers. And we shouldn't pat ourselves, pattern ourselves after them or or their antics. You know, that's our children. You know, one thing that need to guard about, they're cute. But whenever we make too much fuss about them being cute, we give them a, we give them, we're not doing them any favors. We're teaching them to have an attitude that everybody's watching me and the whole world's revolving around me. And I'm cute, and I'm funny, and my opinion's more important. You know, one thing that's more disgusting to me than anything is to listen to someone that's an actor, that's acted out a part, and then the news calls up on them like they're an expert in something they acted in. When they have no business, they're entertainers. They're not the wise men of the field, but they're lifted up as that. And that same thing happens whenever our children are cute. And what we're doing is instilling in our children that they're important and their opinions are important and they're valuable. We don't need to do that. And young men, I appreciate our young men. They're not the first right up in the line trying to tell the older men how to do everything. They're not the ones sitting back thinking, boy, can't wait till I can do this. I'm going to do it a bunch different. That's an attitude that stinks. It's an attitude that's full of pride. And it's an attitude that doesn't fit with seeking truth. There's a time, there will be time enough for you to take your place. But if you're not properly in your place right now, you'll never get to the place you need to be to be the leader or to be the one instructing or to be the one with wisdom that others might look up to you. I don't know what it is about being young. We just have this desire that everyone ought to listen to me and everyone ought to hear my opinion. Everyone wants to hear my opinion. The truth is, until you've earned your wings, nobody cares about your opinion. There's a boy that we work with sometimes that he's always his opinion. He's always running his mouth, and we're telling him constantly to keep his mouth shut and learn, and he just doesn't do it. And it's not a pretty sight something about a young man that thinks that his ideas and his thoughts are so valuable that everybody wants to hear them. And just tell him that he'll just be quiet and just do what he's supposed to do. Then 
somebody might one of these days ask him their opinion on something. And that's the way it ought to be with, with the young men. Whenever you learn how to do what you're told, then pretty soon someone, you'll learn what you're doing, and pretty soon someone will come along and ask you how you're doing what you're doing. And that's when your opinion will matter. Not because you're loud, proud, trying to force it down everybody's throat. Seeking the truth. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 17. No, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 15. Just learned this this morning. A little bit interesting. It's right there, it's simple. But if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. We all know this verse. A lot of times we, it's used often to be able to be the one challenging. You know, one of the things that's, I think, most disagreeable in religion is the one-upmanship. The one-upmanship. The one, you being the leader, you being the teacher, so you can put everybody in their place or show somebody something new. We all enjoy that whenever someone learns. But it becomes that we can't be content with walking in truth. We have to start studying and reading and studying and reading and so we can learn something new to teach someone else so that that somehow satisfies that longing for truth that we don't have that we might really have something. And I think a lot of that one-upmanship or that one got to have the next newest thing is just reveals a lack of contentment in the heart because there's something missing there. And so we're trying to, with an external religious idea, come up with something that I can just be a little higher than everybody else. You know, we had a lot of people in our midst that, that uh, that's the way they wind up. They've always got to be the Noah or the Moses or the one that's just out there on the mountain all by themselves with the truth. And that's not what you do with truth. Truth is to be shared and to be appreciated and to be loved, not to be exalted as you the only one having it. And that's what this is a lot of times used for. Okay, I've got them now. Now I can be higher than this other person. Well, if that's the attitude, there's no reason for you to be going and talking to the one with the fault. You're wrong. No matter how right you are, you're wrong. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, tell it, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. We've all looked at that. By this is what happens. Someone offends me. Someone upsets me. And I go talk to the person and they don't hear me. So what do I do? I go find someone and tell him my whole side of that story and get him convinced that I'm right and that my side of the story, I get him lined up with me on my side of the story. I get a case built and I convince him and then I go talk to the brother that's offended with 
two or three people that I've convinced of my idea and my being wronged so that they've already got their minds made up before they even go talk to the other person. That's how this is practiced. But that's not the way I believe now that that's the way it's supposed to be. You should find a person, whenever it talks about go find the least person that at least esteemed in the church. That's not the one that's with your opinion. That's the one who's going to go and not even know in your situation, just say, I've got a problem. I go and we need to go talk to this brother. And that's it. You don't need to show, prove your case. You sit down together and let the two or three witnesses make their own decisions of how it's supposed to go. Not because you're the best at persuading people to your opinion of how it's supposed to go. The people that you take to hear the situation should be blank judges. Innocent judges, you know, they, they, whenever they try to find a jury, both lawyers ask all kinds of questions about the case, trying to get an impartial jury as they can before they try a person, before they bring him to trial. They try to find people who haven't even heard about the case so that whenever they're presented the evidence, they can make a decision not going in with a mind that's already prejudiced against the person they're trying so that they can actually listen to the case. And only then are they qualified to make a right judgment in the situation. You get two or three people in a mob all stirred up to go talk to somebody. How much justice do you think there's going to be? You know, the old cowboys, they used to go get everybody in town, string the ro grab a rope, and head out of town because they've already tried them, and now all they have to do is catch them. What kind of justice is that? And how is that justice in the church of the Lord? It takes integrity to have truth and want truth. And it's so easy for us to build our cases against a brother. It's so easy when one brother gets all offended, gets his nose out of joint, to go stir people up, to get a group sided against another brother. And that's not at all what Jesus was talking about here. It's a trial, just like Pilate had with Jesus. And Pilate, at least, was willing and open to hear both sides of those this argument. He didn't go in with his mind made up. He knew the consequences of what would happen when he made his decision. He was at least honest in that part of it. How much more should a trial be in the church of the Lord full of integrity with Witnesses that aren't prejudiced already, having their minds made up. Anyway, just a few thoughts on seeking truth. It's there. A lot of times we just don't want it. May the Lord add his blessing. You don't have anything you want to share?
Mm -hmm. And not able to see anything, anybody. Right. Without prejudice. Bias. Amen. This week, our assignment this week was to bring a song or a verse or something about Christ likeness. And I found a song I really appreciate. It's Oh to be like thee. It's Oh to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures. Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. O oh, to be like thee, O oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. I just really appreciate that because that's showing that, that you're putting, putting that desire above everything else. Got a couple verses here in Matthew 6, verse 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust is destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But store, yourself, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust is destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. And I thought that's a good way to be like Christ. Focusing on, focusing on what's to come and not on this earth. I got Philippians 2, verse 5, a few verses. Have this attitude in yourselves, which, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, al although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in, a, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we need to humble ourselves just like he did. I got 2 Corinthians 1, 12. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. Matthew chapter 5. You should love your enemies and pray for those who accuse you. This is how we become Christ-like. Here in Philippians 2, 3 to 6, it says, Do nothing from selfishness, or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it just shows his attitude there and what, how we should be like him. Uh, I was thinking this, a way it would be like Christ is to set yourself apart from the world and like, um, to show you have a higher calling than to this world and not go along with whatever they want, just to show, to set yourself apart from the world and to show everybody that you have a higher calling and not just to please and serve this world. When I think about <clears throat> being Christ like, uh, <clears throat> I like to think about when Jesus was on, was on this earth. Um, and we read in Matthew where you know, his disciples were always asking, what are we going to eat or what are we going to wear? Um, Matthew, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. And uh, no, I do this a lot. I concern myself with what I'm going to do tomorrow or what, what's going to happen, you know, down the road. I think it would be more Christ-like just to let all those things up to God and just focus on what's in front of me right now. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've got a couple thoughts this morning. Well, I guess they kind of tie together. But anyway, um, a verse and wisdom of Sirach, chapter 6, verse 36. If you see a man with understanding, who, who has understanding, 
Rise early in the morning and let your foot wear out the threshold of his door. And I was just reading, reading that verse and I was thinking, well, that's kind of one of the thoughts that came to my mind was someone who has discernment, someone who knows about something that you don't really understand or would like to learn about. And I uh, was thinking about my blacksmithing stuff this week too. And, you know, I don't know anyone else around here that uh, does very much blacksmithing. And I'd like to just have a teacher that I could just go and sit down and learn from or someone that knows how to do it. But I just kind of have to learn on my own. I mean, I can watch videos and stuff and try to learn some things. But, and then I thought, well, in, the, in my spiritual or religious world or realm or whatever, I don't have to go around looking and searching for um, someone because I have family and friends and, excuse me, and like Brother David and Dad that are, uh, understand this a lot better than I do and I, if I have a question I can ask them and go and we're out there threshold and go and visit with those and understand that and also in a, a let's see what other verse was it there's another verse here somewhere that oh, at the bottom of a well I didn't come prepared very well this morning I'm sorry Oh, 37, set your mind on the ordinances of the Lord and the, um, practice His commandments. He will strengthen your heart and the desire of wisdom will be given to you. And when I read that verse, I was thinking, um, I thought of Solomon when he had everything he could ever ask for. God just asked him what he wanted. And he was... Uh, I mean, he could have had anything. He could have had the world rule. But he asked for wisdom and discernment. And God gave it to him and he said, uh, the rest of those things that you would like to have will be added to you. And I was just thinking, wow, that's, that's amazing. He just, God just gave it to him. And that's something we can ask for and be given but we do have to work for it and go and find someone that we can learn from. And, but it's just a blessing to me to have brothers and sisters in here that know about this stuff better than I do that I can go and visit with and learn from. And I thank you all for that. It's just a real, real blessing to me. But that's about all I had this morning. Thank you all. Anybody have any prayer requests? <laughs> I have one that, to make me not so nervous when I come up here. I, could, I had a whole spiel this morning, had, a, had it all figured out, and then I got up here and everything went blank. But anyway. Right, okay. Uh, Chris's grandma up in Iowa, she uh, fell and had an accident. But anyway, she's just pray for her. Okay. Brianna's uncle has a, uh, has cancer this week. Just got diagnosed. So keep him in your prayers. And, Dear God, for this good day that you gave us, and thank you for letting those be able to gather here today and just help us and keep us throughout the day. And please be with the, the prayer requests that were mentioned here, and also uh, Debbie Russell that wasn't mentioned, but anyway, she just help her and let her feel better and heal her. And please help the rest of us that uh, not to get sick or 
just help us to do your will throughout the rest of the week and um, please let us hear something from the sermon this morning to, that will help us and just help us do your will throughout the week. In your name, amen. My God and Cheers.